last episode, we talked about evaluating our path. Decisions become destinations. We need to make sure that we're going the right way. In this episode, we're going to talk about how to establish the right path, and let's make sure we stay on it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll make straight your paths. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we find two directives that will help us walk on the right path. But each directive brings with it an important word, all. Trust the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. You can't do this halfway. To establish your walk on the right path, you got to go all the way. Let's talk about that first directive. Trust the Lord with all your heart. The word trust raises an immediate red flag. In a culture that's become so untrustworthy, it's hard not to have some trust issues. We've been made a fool before. Why be made a fool again? Within my audience of readers and listeners, there are a myriad of stories of failed trust, from bad business deals to failed marriages, from abusive parents to abusive churches, from failed love to failed loans. I'm certain that we can all offer reasons why it's difficult for us to trust anyone or anything. And if it's not hard enough, the author of the proverb closes the loophole. You must trust the Lord with all your heart. When our trust is broken, a sense of shame enters us emotionally. The usual response is to harden the heart just a bit as a defense mechanism. We withhold trust and create a barrier to the heart that must be hurdled by the next more highly qualified emotional acrobat if trust is ever to be offered again. That wall to the heart is much higher and harder in some than it is in others. With every turn, we add another layer of brick. The Hebrew word trust used in Proverbs 3, 5 is interesting. Most often, trust in the Bible is used to describe things you can't trust. You can't trust wealth or the world. You can't trust others. You can't even trust yourself. So isn't it ironic that the Bible made a long list of things you can't trust long before you did? So there's your trust torn and tattered, somewhere locked away with your heart behind a massive wall built out of things you said you would never do again. And here you are at a crossroads, ready to establish a new path. And the Lord says, before we can take that next life-changing step, I need you to trust me with all your heart. So there you go with God trying to pull out your torn and tattered trust, trying to find it somewhere behind that massive wall. And it's kind of like getting pulled over at a roadblock where the state trooper is asking to see your registration and proof of insurance. I'm not a very organized person, so in that moment, he might as well ask me to pull out a unicorn out of my glove box. So here we go fumbling through the mess of it all. Uncomfortably, we say, I know it's in here somewhere, um, right here, probably beside this unicorn, right? We're hoping that in the sincerity of our search, the state trooper will give us the benefit of the doubt that we really do have an insurance card and registration and a unicorn and let us go merrily on our way. And that's worked for me a few times, but with God, he just keeps standing there waiting until we pull out that trust. So if and when we finally dig it out and produce it, we can tell our heart and trust have been hopelessly buried for quite a while. Years of damaged goods and hurtful stories are piled up on top of it. Here's the incredible thing about the word trust that is translated in Proverbs 3, 5. The trust that we gave to all the wrong things is the same trust God wants. He's not looking for a theologically robust trust. All he asks is for what is there, expired, damaged, buried, torn, tattered trust. Whatever it is, though, he requires all that's left of it. Don't forget, we serve a good God who desires for us to end up in a good place. With every step down the right path, the Lord will foster with that experience a growing and deepening trust. We'll talk more about this in a later chapter entitled Presence. But trust is built with the Lord the longer you walk with him and realize that he will not leave you or forsake you. You can walk a long way down the path of restoring trust with God. 
So let's talk about that second directive now. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. We must not only trust God wholeheartedly to walk with Him in the right path means that we also look to Him for everything. The word acknowledge comes from a common Hebrew word that's usually translated to know or to learn. To acknowledge the Lord in all your ways means to learn from Him about everything. How much further could you go if you slowed down and sought the Lord's counsel before you made decisions? Remember one of those benefits of walking with God. Those who walk with God are able to make critical decisions at key moments and accomplish incredible things. Why? Because they acknowledge the Lord in all their ways. To trust the Lord with all your heart and to acknowledge Him in all your ways stands in contrast to the idea and lean not on your own understanding. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Trusting the Lord with all your heart and acknowledging Him in all your ways is at first disorienting because we've never navigated paths like this. There will be times in the path where the Lord's leading may seem counterintuitive to the choices we would have otherwise made for ourselves. Even still, leaning on our own understanding can be dangerous. I unfortunately have an example of this. My wife, Shannon, refers to me as the human GPS. Other than going the wrong way down a one-way street, my sense of direction is otherwise pretty reliable. I've successfully navigated our way down unfamiliar paths numerous times. Most of the time, I can tell you what direction we need to go and pretty much end up where we want to be. There's just something about me that even likes getting lost just so I can prove to everyone in the car that I can get us on the right path again. I I know that's kind of sick, but uh, while I may regard my sense of direction as remarkable, I promise you it's not flawless. Not long after we moved to Birmingham, Alabama in 2002 to serve at Ridgecrest Baptist Church, my wife and I became good friends with two couples in the congregation who had daughters nearly the same age as our own. The husbands in the respective families also happened to serve in our church as deacons. So from time to time, we would take trips together. If it was a trip for several days, the tradition was that one day would be Ladies' Day and all the dads would keep the kids. The following day would be Man Day, and all the moms would, in turn, watch the kids. So on this particular trip, we were in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. A, if you've never been to Pigeon Forge, it's a tourist trap full of hotels and overpaid shows nestled in the Smoky Mountains. So on Man Day, I was determined we were going to escape the trappings of Touristville, and we were going to man up with a hike in the mountains. There's a particular place called Elkmont, high up in the mountains where we frequently camped when I was a child. So I knew of an old home place hidden in the forest where a legendary mountain man once lived, so I drove our guys deep into the woods to see it. Once we arrived and explored a bit, we found a trail. After a brief conversation, we all agreed that this would be the trail that we would hike, and off we went into the forest. The problem is that we proceeded down the trail more like three men who had just paid $150 for a dinner show the night before than we did like three men who knew how to survive in the wilderness. We had no map, no food, no water, and no compass. Ah, Brilliant, I know. But after a couple of hours of walking, we stopped to assess the situation. The sun was still high in the sky, but being deep in the forest, we knew once it began to set, it would get dark pretty quickly. My friend Alan offered the group some sage advice. He said, all I know is that if we turn around and go back the way we came, we'll end up where we started. Yet I, the human GPS, had another perspective. Guys, I've been watching this hillside since we started walking, and it stayed on our left the entire time. It it seems to me like we're walking around it. I saw another trailhead just below the one we entered, and I think it's it's a loop. So what if we turn around and walk back? If we turn around, we may double our distance when we might be right now near the end. By that time, I estimated we had walked about two and a half miles. So why walk two and a half more when we may be only a few hundred yards from the end? I mean, it sounds logical, right? So for some reason, they agreed. And so we walked on down the path. 
The shadows grew longer. The conversation continued. Alan, all I know is if we turn around and go back to the way we came. Me, I've been watching this hillside. I think it's a loop. And each time we got into that discussion, I reason if we turn back, we may double our distance. And so... After actually doubling our distance, for some reason now my former friends, but fellow hikers, continued to believe me. Several miles later, the shadows had turned into a mild cover of darkness. Alan had offered us a grand opportunity, turn back. But that offer had long since passed, and we were now so far down the trail, tired, thirsty, hungry, and ill-equipped, that by this time, turning back meant that we would be walking back in the dark. So about the time we began talking about how to survive the night, we came to a crossroads in the path. The sign pointed five miles to a pump station in the direction of Cades Cove and three miles to a place called Metcalf Bottoms. I'd been to the Smoky Mountains enough to know three things about Metcalf Bottoms. One, it was indeed the bottom, as the name indicates. A nice descent would be welcome at this point. Secondly, The main road runs alongside the creek at Metcalf Bottoms. Perhaps we could be rescued. And thirdly, Metcalf Bottoms was a long, long way from where we started. 12 miles by car, to be exact. You may ask how I know that? Allow me to explain. When the three of us emerged from the ever-darkening wood, dirty and haggard, we were forced to do something I had never previously experienced. The preacher who had turned man day into an almost disastrous hike would now have to resort to hiking of a different sort, hitchhiking. So there we stood at the edge of the road, three dirty, dorky men flagging down cars in the curve. Finally, a kind elderly couple from Michigan pulled over to the side of the road. I had already rehearsed what I would say in my mind several times. Um, sir, ma'am, my name is Brian. I'm a pastor in Birmingham, Alabama. These men are two of my deacons. We're lost in the woods and we need a ride back to our car. That's right, a 12-mile ride back to our car. Remember what the Bible says? Lean not on your own understanding that there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is a very dark hike. God's not like a foolish preacher who thinks he is a human GPS. God really does know where he's going. And he wants you to go a long way, the right way. He's good, and he'll lead you to a good place if you trust him with all your heart and acknowledge him in all your ways. He will establish for you the right path. Because God is good, you can trust the Lord with all your heart. Because God knows all things, you can acknowledge him in all your ways. Put your torn and tattered trust in the Lord. He'll lead you down the right path. We'll talk more about the importance of paths in the next episode, but until then, visit my website, brianbrandom.com. Check out my latest book, Pulse, a great book for men who've lost trust. Thanks for joining me in today's episode of A Walk Through the Summer.